All right, let's get right into it. Your assigned problems may or may not have different randomized values. For best results, attempt the assignment on your own before watching these solutions. Students are encouraged to frequently pause the video to work out steps on their own before proceeding with the solutions. And here's the list of topics to be covered in this video. Problem 1. The magnitude r of an earthquake on the Richter scale is given by the common logarithm, or log base 10, of the ratio a divided by a0, where a is the amplitude of the earthquake and a0 is the amplitude of the smallest detectable wave. An earthquake is measured with a wave amplitude 364 times as great as a0, so what is its magnitude on the Richter scale measured to the nearest tenth? Well, our amplitude, capital A, is 364 times as great as a0, so we set a equal to 364 a0. By the definition given at the beginning of the problem, the measurement on the Richter scale is therefore the log of a over a0. The a0s cancel, and we simply have the common logarithm of 364. All we have to do now is plug this into a calculator and round off to the nearest tenth. It's about 2.6. Incidentally, an earthquake that measures 2.6 on the Richter scale, according to Wikipedia, is felt slightly by some people. There is no damage to any buildings. As someone who grew up in California, I can tell you that a 2.6 magnitude earthquake doesn't even make the evening news on a slow news day. Problem 2. The largest earthquake in a certain year was in the ocean and recorded 7.5 on the Richter scale. The most devastating earthquake in a major city measured 5.9 on the Richter scale. How many more times intense was the earthquake in the ocean compared to the earthquake in the city. Use r is equal to the logarithm of i over i0, where i0 is a certain minimum intensity used for comparison. So let's suppose the two earthquakes have intensities i1 and i2, respectively. We are given that i1, the intensity of the ocean earthquake, will satisfy 7.5, its measurement on the Richter scale, is the logarithm of i1 over i0, and similarly, the earthquake in a city, 5.9 was its measurement, will be the logarithm of i2 over i0. Separating the log of a ratio as a difference of two logarithms, and then adding that logarithm to both sides, we can establish that 7.5 on the left, otherwise written as 5.9 plus 1.6, plus the log of i0 is equal to the log of i1, whereas on the right, 5.9 plus the log of i0 is equal to the log of i2. And the purpose of splitting the 7.5 into 5.9 plus 1.6 is so that we have a common term of comparison between the two. In other words, the difference between log 1 minus log i2 will be exactly that 1.6. So we've established that the log of i1 minus the log of i2 is exactly 1.6. Therefore, the log of their ratio is 1.6. Exponentiating with base 10 gives us that the ratio i1 over i2 is about 39.81. In other words, i1, the intensity of the ocean earthquake, is about 39.81 times the intensity of i2, the one in the city. The equation below models the value of a certain car purchased for $5,000 over time. The value v is p times the quantity 1 minus 0 0.08 raised to the t, where v is the value in dollars, T is the age of the car in years, and capital P is the purchase price in dollars. Which of the following statements best describes the situation? A $5,000 car decreases in value by 0.08% each year. A $5,000 car decreases in value by 8% each year. A $5,000 car decreases in value by 92% each year. A $5,000 car increases in value by 8% each year. Or a $5,000 car increases in value by 92% each year. So the value in one year, I'm going to call v of t, and the value in the next year would therefore be v of t plus 1. And what we're interested in is the ratio of v of t plus 1 divided by v of t. In other words, the value in the next year divided by the value in this year. So plugging that into the expression given at the top of the page, we get p times 1 minus 0 0.08 to the t plus 1 divided by p times 1 minus 0 0.08 to the t. The p's cancel, as does, in fact, 1 minus 0 0.08 to the t power. Cancel that from the denominator and t of those powers from the numerator, and this ratio, v of t plus 1 over v of t, is merely 1 minus 0 0.08, or 0 0.92. So every year that passes, the car is worth next year 92% of what it was worth this year, meaning it is decreasing by 8% per year, and that's option B. Problem 4. The equation below models the value of a certain car over time. v is equal to 23,000 times 0.8 to the t, where v is the value in dollars and t is the age of the car in years. Which of the following statements best describes the situation? 
We have five options, all describing a $23,000 car. It could either decrease in value by 20% a year, decrease in value by 8% a year, increase in value by 20% a year, decrease in value by 80% a year, or increase in value by 80% a year. Just as in problem three, we're gonna compute the ratio V of T plus one divided by V of T, the value in the next year divided by the value in a particular year. The 23,000s cancel and 0 0.8 raised to the T power in the denominator cancels most of the powers in the numerator, leaving behind just one power, 0 0.8. So every year that passes, the car is worth 80% of what it was worth in the previous year. In other words, it is losing 20% of its value per year. That's option A. Problem five, a car purchased for $19,000 depreciates at a constant rate of 17.5% per year is the implication. What will be the value of the car in six years? Use the formula V is equal to P times one minus R to the T. So we know that R, the rate of depreciation is 17.5% or 0 0.175. Also P is the purchase price, $19,000. So we have the value after t years is 19,000 times 1 minus 0 0.175 raised to the t power. So for six years, we can let t equal six and we compute v of six. All we have to do is plug it in and use a calculator and this works out rounded off to two decimal points to be $5,990.70. So after spending $19,000 on a car, six years later, it's worth about $6,000. This is pretty typical for car depreciation. Problem six, a house is valued at $115,000 in the year 1990, and the value appreciated to $165,000 by the year 2004. What was the annual growth rate between 1990 and 2004 rounded to four decimal places? We're going to use the formula that the value after T years is given by P, the principal, times one plus R, the rate of appreciation, to the T, where T is measured in years. First, the value at year 1,990 is known to be 115,000. Now one could be clever about the formula we used, letting T not just be the year, but the number of years elapsed since a certain point in time, but we'll see that this isn't actually necessary. So we can simply say that T is the year, and we get that P times one plus R to the 1,990 power is 115,000. But using the value in the year 2004, we get P times one plus R to the 2004 is $165,000. And we can take the ratio of these two statements. Notice that the P's will cancel. On the right, I simply have two numbers. There's going to just be some simplification there. And one plus R to the 2004 over one plus R to the 1,990, we can cancel 1,990 powers of one plus R out of the numerator, leaving behind one plus R to the 14th equals 33 over 23. That 33 over 23 is just what you get when you simplify 165,000 over 115,000. So now we wish to solve for R, the annual growth rate, and it's buried underneath this exponent. And the way we get rid of exponents is by taking logarithms. So by taking a natural log of both sides, we can bring that exponent out as a scalar multiple. 14 times the logarithm of one plus R is equal to the log of 33 over 23. We can now divide both sides by 14. But now our R is buried inside a logarithm. So how are we going to get it? We're going to re-exponentiate both sides. So I'm gonna take E to the left is equal to E to the right. And on the left, E to the log of one plus R is just one plus R. And on the right, we get E to the 1 14th times the natural log of 33 over 23. But now we can solve for R by subtracting one from both sides. Computing this on a calculator, R is approximately 0.0261 or 2.61%. What is the answer to part A written as a percentage? I gave it away, it's 2.61%. Assuming the house appreciates at the same rate, what will the value be in the year 2007? So every year, the value is increasing by 2.61%. In other words, we multiply by the value by 1.0261. In 2007, that will be three years after 2004. So we can multiply the 2004 value by 1.0261 cubed, and if you do that, it works out to be about 178,000 and change. A bank features a savings account that has an annual percentage rate of 4% with interest compounded quarterly. Dario deposits $6,000 into the account. 
The account balance can be modeled by the exponential formula a of t is equal to a times 1 plus r over k to the kt power, where a is the account value after t years, little a is the principal or starting amount, r is the annual percentage rate, k is the number of times per year that the interest is compounded. What values should be used for a, r, and k? So the initial deposit A is given to be $6,000. Similarly, the interest rate is given to be 4%, converting that to a decimal, 0 0.04. And the number of compoundings per year, since it's compounded quarterly, there are four quarters per year, so we set K equal to four. How much money will be in the account after nine years? So we already know to set little a to 6,000, r to 0 0.04, and k to 4, and since we are now predicting how much money will be in the account after 9 years, we set t equal to 9, and all there is to do is plug and chug. The value after 9 years will be approximately $8,584.61. What is the annual percentage yield? In other words, instead of compounding quarterly, if we wanted to get the same return but only compounding annually, what would that interest rate be? So we assume that nine years later, we have $8,584.61. This is what we computed for part B. However, we're going to let the number of compoundings be one. And now what we have to do is solve for r. So letting k equal 1 turns this into something a little simpler. We have our value at time 9 on the left, 6,000 times 1 plus r to the 9th on the right, and we need to solve for r, which will now be the annual percentage yield, the interest rate compounded annually that would get us to the same place. So divide both sides by 6,000. Now we have that exponent of 9 to take care of, so take logs of both sides, divide both sides by 9, re-exponentiate, and subtract 1. So the annual percentage yield, r, is e to the 1 9th times the natural log of 8,584.61 divided by 6,000, all minus 1. Plugging this into a calculator and computing, we get about 0.0406, or 4.06%. In problem 8, we will find the time required for an investment of $5,000 to grow to $8,900 at an interest rate of 7.5% per year compounded quarterly. So we have this formula that we've used in the previous few problems. V of t is p times 1 plus r over k to the kt. Our principal is $5,000. We know we want to reach a value of $8,900. We know our interest rate is going to be 7.5%, converted to a decimal, 0 0.075. We also know we're compounding quarterly, so k is 4. The unknown is t. So we set $8,900 equals 5,000 times the quantity 1 plus 0 0.075 over 4, all raised to the 4t power. To solve this for t, the first thing we want to do is divide both sides by 5,000. Canceling off 100 from both sides, we now have 89 over 50 is equal to this exponential expression. But the variable we are attempting to solve for t is up in the exponent. How do we get it out of the exponent? Take a log of both sides. Then that exponent for t can be brought out as a scalar factor. So the log of 89 over 50 is equal to 4 times t times the log of 1 plus 0 0.075 over 4. Solving for t, we just need to divide both sides by 4 and divide both sides by the log of 1 plus 0 0.075 over 4. And at this point, we've solved for t. The only thing left to do is to plug this into a calculator and compute the result. If you're interested in that, it's about 7.76 years. Suppose $5,000 is invested in a bank account at an interest rate of 5% per year. We're going to be asked what the value of the account is after 14 years if the interest is compounded at various different stages. So let's remember that the value after t years is given by the principal times 1 plus r over k to the kt, where p, the principal, is given to be $5,000, r, the interest rate, is given to be 5% as a decimal, that's 0 0.05, and the time we are waiting is given to be 14 years. So what if we're compounding interest annually? That just means we are getting our interest once per year. We set k equal to 1. We plug that all into our existing formula, where p is equal to 5,000, r is 0 0.05, t is 14, and now k is 1. And this works out to be about $9,899.66. Well, what if we compound the interest quarterly? So we get one quarter as much interest, but we get it four times as often. So we set k is equal to 4 plug and chug our way to $10,025.17. If we were to get our interest 12 times as often, but get 1 12th as much interest, we'd set k equal to 12, 
plug and chug our way to $10,054.13. So every time we increase how often we're getting our interest by also scale down how much interest we get by the proportional amount, we get slightly more money. Going annually to quarterly made about $125 worth of difference, but going from quarterly to monthly barely made $28, $29 worth of difference. So what if we compound continuously, not monthly, but daily, not daily, but hourly, not hourly, but every second, and so forth and so forth, and see what happens as you consider just compounding continuously. Now for continuous compounding, we have a simpler formula to use. The value after t years compounded continuously is the principal p times e to the rt. So t is still 14, r is still 0.05, and the principal is 5,000. So we compute this and we get $10,068.76. The Fox population in a certain region has a continuous growth rate of 5% per year. It is estimated that the population in the year 2000 was 27,500. First, find a function to model the population t years after 2000. In other words, the year 2000 represents t equals zero, and we begin counting from there. Use an exponential function with base e. That's just a hint to remind us we're using our continuous growth function. The population t years after 2000 will be p naught, the population in the year 2000, times e to the rt, where r is the growth rate. So we were given a population of 27,500 in the year 2000 and a growth rate of 5%, or 0.05. Next, use the function you derived to estimate the Fox population in the year 2008. So 2008 is 8 years after 2000, so we set t equal to 8 and just plug it into the formula we derived in part a. This works out to be about 41,025, which we rounded to the nearest integer since we are counting foxes and we usually don't have something like 0.27 of a fox. The doubling period of a bacterial population is given to be 20 minutes, and at time t equals 110 minutes, the bacterial population is 90,000. The first thing we're going to do is solve for the initial population, the population at time t equals 0. Now we're following this exponential growth model, so the population at time t is the initial population, which we do not know, times e to the rt, where r is the growth rate, which we also do not know a value for. What we do know, however, is that the doubling time is 20 minutes. Meaning, whatever the initial population is, 20 minutes later we have twice as much. So the population at time 20 is two times the initial population. But we also know that the population at time 20 matches this exponential formula, so we can set these two things equal to each other. 2 p naught is equal to p naught times e to the 20 r. Canceling out our p naughts, we get e to the 20 r is equal to 2. We can solve this for r by taking logs of both sides and dividing by 20. So our growth rate r is 1 over 20 times the natural log of 2. Now we could plug this into a calculator and round off to a couple decimal points, but since we are going to have more parts of the problem to do, I prefer to save any rounding errors for the very, very end. Here is r. It is 1 over 20 times the natural log of 2. Then we're going to take that value of r into the given that the population at time 110 was 90,000. So 90,000 is the initial population times e to the rt, where r is 1 over 20 times log 2, and t is 110 minutes. To find the initial population, we simply need to divide by that exponential. So 90,000 divided by e to the 1 over 20 times log 2 times 110. At this point, it may be productive to get an estimate. It works out to be about 1,989, rounded to the nearest integer since we are counting things. In part b, find the size of the bacterial population after 4 hours. Now we've been measuring time in minutes, so let's continue to do so. 4 hours is 240 minutes. So all we need to do is compute the population at time 240 minutes, p naught e to the 240 times r. And without introducing any rounding errors, we're going to use exact values for p naught and r. So p naught was 90,000 divided by e to the 120th log 2 times 110, and r was 1 over 20 times log 2. So here we have it, now we just need to simplify some stuff down. Notice that we have an exponential divided by an exponential. We have e to something divided by e to something else. So we can write that as e to the one power in the numerator minus the power from the denominator. So 90,000 times e to the 240 over 20 log 2 minus 110 over 20 log 2. We've got a common denominator of 20 and a log 2 that we can factor out. This simplifies to 90,000 times e to the 130 over 20 log 2. 130 over 20 is just 13 over 2, but observe, due to properties of exponents, if I have e to one number times another, I can write this as e to the log 2, then raised to the 13 over 2. Why would I do that? Because e to the natural log of 2 is exactly 2. So we have 90,000 times 2 to the 13 over 2. Now 2 to the 13 over 2 is 2 to the 12th, 
over 2 times 2 to the 1 over 2. And 2 to the 12 over 2 is just 2 to the 6. So we have 90,000 times 2 to the 6 times root 2. Here's a nice exact answer. 2 to the 6 times 90,000 is 5.76 million times square root of 2. And at this point, we can introduce some rounding error. It's about 8.14 million. Problem 12. The count in a bacterial culture was 700 after 10 minutes and 1,700 after 35 minutes. Assuming the count grows exponentially, first we're going to ask what was the initial size of the culture. Then we're going to find the doubling period. And then we're going to find the population after 105 minutes. Finally, when will the population reach 10,000? So we have this exponential growth model. The population at time t is the initial population times e to the rt. We are given that the population at time 10 is 700. And we're also given that the population at time 35 is 1700. So 700 must be the initial population times e to the 10 r, and 1700 must be the initial population times e to the 35 r. We can take a ratio of these two things. The p naughts cancel out, but we end up with the nice ratio 17 over 7 is e to the 25 r. We can solve that for r by taking a log and dividing by 25. r is exactly 1 over 25 times the natural log of 17 over 7. So in our exponential growth model, that the population at time t is the initial population times e to the rt, we've solved for r the growth rate to be exactly 1 over 25 times the natural log of 17 over 7. I'm not going to plug this into a calculator to introduce rounding error until I absolutely have to. Now we're going to take this exact value of r and plug it into either of our given values. For example, 700 is the population at time 10. We are trying to solve for the initial population, so divide both sides by e to the 10 r. We end up with that the initial population is 700 times e to the negative 10 r. Now we can plug in our known value of r. 700 times e to the negative 10 over 25 times the natural log of 17 over 7, and at this point we can plug into a calculator and round off to the nearest integer that our initial population is about 491 bacteria. Next, we're going to take our initial population and try to find the doubling period. So we're going to solve at what time is the population exactly twice the population we started with. So we happen to know r, but we're not going to write it out every time. Okay, r is exactly 1 over 25 times the natural log of 17 over 7, but as we do our work, I'm just going to keep writing r until the end so that I don't have to write as much. So we're looking for the population at time t on the right to be exactly twice the initial population there on the left. The p naughts actually cancel, and we just need to solve this for t. So we take a log of both sides and divide by r. And at this point, we can plug our r back in. That t is equal to 25 times the natural log of 2 divided by the logarithm of 17 over 7, which rounds to about 19.53 minutes. Next up, let's find the population after 105 minutes. Well, since we know the initial population and we know the value of r, all we have to do is plug in t equals 105. An exact expression using our exact value of r would be that the population after 105 minutes is 491 times e to the 105 over 25 times the log of 17 over 7, which rounds off to be about 20,396. And finally, in part D, when will the population reach 10,000? So we set the population at an unknown time to be 10,000. So 10,000 is p naught times e to the rt. So we'll solve this for t, and then we'll replace the known values. This will simply cut down on the amount of writing. So we divide both sides by p naught. We take a log of both sides, and we divide by r. So the t we are attempting to solve for is 1 over r times the natural log of 10,000 over p naught. All we have to do now is plug in our known values of p naught and r, and this resolves to 25 times the natural log of 10,000 over 491, divided by the natural log of 17 over 7. Plugging and chugging, when will the population reach 10,000? At approximately 84.92 minutes. In problem 13, you go to the doctor and he gives you 10 milligrams of radioactive dye. You may or may not need it, but as long as they're handing out free samples, let's go for it. After 20 minutes, 7.5 milligrams of dye remain in your system. To leave the doctor's office, you must pass through a radiation detector without sounding the alarm. If the detector sounds, if there's more than 2 milligrams of the dye in your system, how long will your visit to the doctor take, assuming that you were given the dye as soon as you arrived? 
to, the given information can be used to find r, the decay rate. So the amount at time t is the initial amount times e to the rt. We know the initial amount to be 10 milligrams, and we also know that after 20 minutes, 7.5 milligrams remain. So 7.5 is the amount after time t equals 20. Dividing both sides by 10, taking a log and dividing by 20, we can now solve for r, the decay rate of the dye, to be 1 over 20 times the natural log of 0.75. Now we can get to the actual question that was asked. When will there be only 2 milligrams remaining? We set the amount to be 2 and solve for t, the time. So the amount is 2, and on the right we have 10 times e to the r t, where r is the value we already found. We need to solve this for t, so the first thing we do is divide both sides by 10, take a log of both sides, and observe now we have on the right-hand side a constant times t, so we can divide by that constant and solve for t. Plugging and chugging, t is approximately 118.89 minutes. In problem 14, a wooden artifact from an ancient tomb contains 40% of the C14 that is present in living trees. How long ago to the nearest year was the artifact made, given that the half-life of C14 is 5,730 years? So the amount of C14 present is going to follow this exponential decay model, the initial amount times e to the rt. The half-life of 5,730 years can give us r, the decay rate of C14. The amount at 5,730 years is one half the initial amount. This is what half-life means. So we set one half a naught to be the amount at 5,730 years, a naught times e to the 5,730 times r. The a naughts cancel, and we can solve for r by taking a log and dividing by 5,730. Now we can use this value of r to find t, given that the amount at time t is 40% what we started. Right now, t years have passed since the wood was felled and used to make an artifact, and we know that the amount of C14 present, A of t, is 40% of what it started with, 0.4 times A0. So the amount at time t, 0.4 times A0, is A of t, A0 times e to the rt, where r was the value we've already found. The only unknown now is t, so we can divide both sides by A0 and cancel that. We can take a log of both sides, and now we can solve for t, and plugging and chugging, it's about 7,575 years, rounded to the nearest year, as was requested. In problem 15, at the beginning of an experiment, a scientist has 156 grams of radioactive goo. After 180 minutes, her sample has decayed to 4.875 grams. We're asked a few things. What's the half-life of the goo in minutes? We want to find a formula, g of t, for the amount of goo remaining at time t. And then finally, how many grams of goo will remain after 80 minutes? So we're going to use the given information to find r, the decay rate. Again, we are following this exponential decay model. And what we know is that we start with 156 grams, but after 180 minutes, only 4.875 grams remain. So we set 4.875, the amount after 180 minutes, to be 156, the starting amount, times e to the 180 times r. r is the only unknown, so we can solve for it. Divide both sides by 156, take a log, divide by 180. r is 1 over 180 times the natural log of 4.875 divided by 156. Now we can take this value of r to find the half-life to answer part a. The half-life is the t which solves the amount at time t is one-half what you started with. So we set one-half the amount we started with equal to a of t, the initial amount times e to the rt. The a naughts cancel, we know the value of r, and you can solve for t, and it works out after you plug and chug to be about 36 minutes. In part B, we're asked to find a formula, g of t, for the amount of goo remaining at time t, which we've pretty much already done. It's following this exponential model. We know that the initial amount is 156 grams, and we solved for r in part A. Part C, we're going to use this formula to answer how much goo remains after 80 minutes. So we set t equal to 80 and simply plug and chug, and we end up with about 33.43 grams. The real work in this problem was in part A, solving for r. I would point out that our scientist is probably in a lot of trouble. I am not a nuclear physicist, but a half-life of 36 minutes is a very short half-life. 
as substances decay, energy is released. And the faster they're decaying, the more energy is being released. And that energy has to go somewhere. So this sample is probably extraordinarily radioactive, especially having started with 156 grams of the stuff. That's kind of a lot. So there's a lot of radiation going on here. In problem 16, an object with an initial temperature of 120 degrees Fahrenheit is submerged in a large tank of water whose temperature is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Find a formula, f of t, for the temperature of the object after t minutes if the cooling constant is k equals 1.4. So Newton's law of cooling is the relevant formula here. The temperature at time t is u plus t naught minus u times e to the minus kt. Capital T is the temperature of the object. This is the f of t that we're asked for in this problem. Lowercase t is time, t naught is the initial temperature of the object, and u represents the temperature of the surrounding medium, which is assumed to always be constant. In this problem, we are starting at a temperature of 120 degrees Fahrenheit, and the water bath is held constant at 50 degrees. The cooling constant k was given to be 1.4, assuming we're measuring time in minutes. So f of t is u, 50, plus t naught minus u, 120 minus 50, e to the minus kt, e to the minus 1.4t, which simplifies down to 50 plus 70 times e to the minus 1.4t. In problem 17, a roasted turkey is taken from an oven when its temperature has reached 185 degrees Fahrenheit. It is then placed on a table in a room where the temperature is 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Give answers to the following questions to at least two decimal places. First, if the temperature of the turkey is 151 degrees Fahrenheit after half an hour, what will its temperature be after 45 minutes? So we have Newton's law of cooling here. We know that we are starting at a temperature of 185 and that our surrounding medium is being held at 75 degrees. So we end up with the temperature at time t is 75 plus 110 e to the minus kt, but we do not know the cooling constant k. But we know that at time t equals 30 minutes, the temperature is 151 degrees. So we plug that in and we get 151 is 75 plus 110 times e to the minus 30 k, where t is 30 here. Okay, subtracting 75 from both sides and dividing by 110 and taking a logarithm and dividing by negative 30, we now have a value for k. k is negative 1 30th times the natural log of 76 over 110. Using this value of k, we can now plug and chug our way to get the temperature at 45 minutes. All we do is take that value of k, which I'm not going to copy over again, and we set t is equal to 45, and if we plug and chug, we get 138 degrees Fahrenheit. Part b, when will the turkey cool to 100 degrees Fahrenheit? So we set the temperature to be 100 degrees, and what we don't know is the time t, but we know that capital T should be 100, and k is written here just as k, but we do have an exact value for it. We solved for it in part a. Subtracting 75 and dividing by 110, taking a log and dividing by negative k, which we do have a value for, we get that t, our unknown, is 30 times the natural log of 25 over 110 divided by the natural log of 76 over 110, which is roughly 120 minutes.